Last week I started a two-part message called True Faith, uh, where we took a little bit deeper look at uh, Avraham and, um, and how that applies to us today. This particular message has to do with the intentional hardness of faith. The intentional hardness of faith, and I'll, you'll understand what I mean as we go along. The first passage in the scripture that we want to look at is Yohanan, John. Chapter 6, almost the entire chapter because we need to set the stage for what comes at the end. So, Yohanan, John 6, verse 1. Sometime later, Yeshua went over to the far side of of Lake Kinneret, that is Lake Tiberias, also known as the Sea of Galilee. And a large crowd followed him because they had seen the miracles he had performed on the sick. So I want you to pay attention to that because that's, that is a key statement. The reason they followed him is because they had seen him do miracles. Okay. Yeshua went up into the hills and sat down there with his Talmudim. Now the Judean festival of Pesach was coming up, so when Yeshua looked up and saw that a large crowd was approaching, he said to Philip, Where will we be able to buy bread so that these people can eat? Now Yeshua said this to test Philip, for Yeshua himself knew what he was about to do. Philip answered, Half a year's wages wouldn't buy enough bread for them. Each one would get only a bite. One of the Talmudim, Andrew, the brother of Shimon Kepha, said to him, There's a young fellow here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but how far will they go among many, among so many? Yeshua said, Have the people sit down. There was a lot of grass there, so they sat down. The number of men was about 500, uh, excuse me, 5,000. Then Yeshua took the loaves of bread and after making a bracha, or a blessing, gave to all who were sitting there and likewise with the fish as much as they wanted. And after they had eaten their fill, he told his Talmudim, gather the leftover pieces so that nothing gets wasted. They gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Now a lot of times, you know, many, many times, um, that's the text that preachers will use and they'll preach a message from that text. But that text isn't the point of this chapter. It's not the point of the story. Okay, we have to read on. Verse 14, when the people saw the miracle he had performed, they said, this has to be the prophet. Okay, what did I say last week about judging someone by the miracles they perform? I said you can't judge a person's character and whether or not they have a relationship with God by whether or not they can perform miracles. Okay? Because even those who don't have relationship with God can perform miracles. Okay? Yeshua knew that they were on the point of coming and seizing him in order to make him king. So he went back to the hills again. This time he went by himself. When evening came, his Talmudim went down to the lake, got into a boat, and set out across the lake toward Kafar Nahum. Uh, by the way, for those of you who were not here last week, 
I, I actually need to finish my statement in regards to judging people. I said you don't judge them by whether or not they perform miracles. But what I did go on to say was you do judge them by the fruit of their lives. Okay? So the reason I'm bringing this up now is because this whole chapter, the story of this chapter, and we'll see this, is that the people are responding to Yeshua because of what he's doing, not because of who he is. Okay? So that's, that's the point I'm, I'm, I'm wanting us to see. By now it was dark. Yeshua had not yet joined them, and the sea was getting rough because a strong wind was blowing. They had rowed three or four miles when they saw Yeshua approaching the boat, walking on the lake. They were terrified, but he said to them, Stop being afraid, it is I. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and instantly the boat reached the land they were heading for. So as soon as he got in the boat, they were translated from where they were right to the shore. Okay. The next day, the crowd which had stayed on the other side of the lake noticed that there had been only one boat there and that Yeshua had not entered the boat with his Talmudim, but that the Talmudim had been alone when they sailed off. Then other boats from Tiberias came ashore near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had made the bracha. Accordingly, when the crowd saw that neither Yeshua nor his Talmudim were there on that side of the lake with them, they themselves boarded the boats and made for Kafarnahum in search of Yeshua. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Yeshua answered, Yes, indeed, I tell you, you're not looking for me because... Um, you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the bread and had all you wanted. Don't work for the food which passes away, but for the food that stays on into eternal life, which the Son of Man will give. For this is the one on whom God the Father has put his seal. So they were following Yeshua in order to get from him. So they said to him, what should we do in order to perform the works of God? Remember, I used this passage um, in a, a couple weeks back. Yeshua answered, Here's what the work of God is, to trust in the one He sent. They said to Him, "Nu, no. what miracle will you do for us so that we may see it and trust you? Wrong thing to say to Yeshua. What work can you perform? Our fathers ate, man, ate man in the desert. As it says in the Tanakh, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Yeshua said to them, Yes, indeed, I tell you, it wasn't Moshe who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father is giving you the genuine bread from heaven. For God's bread is the one who comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread from now on. So they're still, they're still thinking physical bread. Okay? This is so cool. Yeshua can give us physical bread that we'll eat and we'll never be hungry again. We'll never have to eat again. Okay? We've, we've seen him do these other miracles. He must be telling the truth about this one too. Okay? <sighs> Yeshua answered, I am the bread, which is life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever trusts in me will never be thirsty. I told you that, that you have seen, but still don't trust. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will certainly not turn away. For I have come down from heaven to do not my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose any of all those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. Yes, this is the will of my Father, 
that all who see the Son and trust in Him should have eternal life, and that I should raise them up on the last day. At this, the Judeans, now the, now the religious leaders are starting to get in on the act. Up until this point, they've been silent, and it's just been the common people talking to Yeshua. At this, the Judeans began grumbling about what about him because he said, I am the bread which has come down from heaven. They understood, at least to some extent, what he was alluding to about himself. And they didn't like it. They said, isn't this Yeshua ben Yosef? We know his father and mother. How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Yeshua answered them, stop grumbling to each other. No one can come to me unless the Father, the one who sent me, draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by Adonai. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Yes, indeed, I tell you, whoever trusts has eternal life. I am the bread which is life. Your fathers ate the man in the desert. They died. But the bread that comes down from heaven is such that a person may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Furthermore, the bread that I will give is my own flesh, and I will give it for the life of the world. Okay? I'm just going to keep reminding you, these people are hearing these words, and they're thinking in physical, temporal, natural terms. Okay? So they're hearing this man say, my flesh is the bread. Okay? At this, the Judeans disputed with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Yeshua said to them, Yes, indeed, I tell you that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. This was a statement that was absolutely abhorrent. Okay? This would, in essence, in there, what they were hearing is this guy is telling us that we are to be cannibals. Okay? It was abhorrent to them. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That is, I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live through the Father, so also whoever eats me will live through me. So this is the bread that has come down from heaven. It is not like the bread the fathers ate. They're dead. But whoever eats this bread will live forever. He said these things as he was teaching in a synagogue in Kepharnahum. On hearing it, this is where... This is the place we're getting to. On hearing it, many of his Talmudim said, This is a hard word. Who can bear to listen to it? But Yeshua, aware that his Talmudim were grumbling about this, said to them, This is a trap for you? Suppose you were to see the Son of Man going back up to where he was before. It is the Spirit... Now here, here, here he's giving them the keys to what he has just said, if they'll get it. Okay? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help. Okay? So he's telling them, what I've just said to you, hint, hint, is spiritual. Okay? The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Yet some among you do not trust. For Yeshua knew from the outset which ones would not trust him, also which one would betray him. This, he said, is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has made it possible for him. 
From this time on, many of his Talmudim turned back and no longer traveled around with him. Okay? That's where we're going to stop. Why was this such a hard word? Why did Yeshua do this? It tells us in the beginning of the passage and at the end of the passage that Yeshua knew ahead of time what was going to happen. Okay? He foreknew this whole long scenario that lasted over a couple days, basically. First of all, we have an incident where they have physical bread that they eat. Okay? And then he uses that and, the, and its multiplication as a, an object lesson to begin teaching them about the spiritual bread. But they're still thinking in physical bread terms as he's talking to them. And he knows that the only way that they're going to understand what he has to say is if the Spirit reveals it to them. If the Father makes it possible for them to understand. Okay? And so he intentionally, intentionally made these inflammatory statements to this group of people because, and here's the key, because he was intentionally, purposely weeding out people. Okay? He knew that several of these people that had been following him around after he was done weren't going to follow him anymore. Okay? And the reason that he didn't want them to follow him anymore is because they were following him because of what they could get from him and not because they wanted to be in relationship with him. Okay? So why, why did they leave Yeshua? They left Yeshua because he basically gave them a message, as it says in the passage, that they couldn't handle. Last week, uh, we talked about Avraham giving up Yitzchak. And the question, the question I want to ask is, when God spoke to Avraham and said, I want you to sacrifice your only son, was this a hard word to Avraham? Yes. Yes, it was a hard word. It was intentionally hard. In fact, God makes the statement once Avraham has gone through the whole process and is ready to take the knife and slit his son's throat to do the deed. That's when God stops him and says, Now I know that you will follow me. That you'll obey me. Okay? It was to test Avraham to see what he would do. Would, at the hard word of God, would he go away? Or would he stay and obey, even though he didn't necessarily know all the details of why God was requiring this of him? Like I said last week, I believe that he had the ability to go through it because there was the understanding that it was a shadow of what he had seen in the vision. Yeshua spoke of him seeing, of Avraham seeing Yeshua. And I believe that God had given him a vision of Yeshua's life, death, and resurrection. And he understood that the offering of his son was a shadow of that. And Hebrews said that he, he believed that if he actually had to take his son's life, that God would raise him from the dead. And I believe it was because he had seen in a vision God raising Yeshua from the dead. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. I'm about to read you another hard 
word. It says, but not only that, let us also boast in our troubles. Boast in our troubles. Because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And this hope does not let us down because God's love for us has already been poured out in our hearts through the Ruach HaKodesh who has been given to us. Is this a hard word? Yes. It is. Boast in your troubles. In another place it says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and tribulations. God is constantly, constantly testing us. To see, to determine our metal, to determine what we're made of, to determine whether we're going to go away from Him or not. So He is intentionally hard on us, intentionally stretches us. That's why God makes faith hard. And so, you know. There is an ultimate challenge for each one of us of some sort. And God knows what that ultimate challenge is. And when that ultimate challenge comes, He wants to find out how many of us will be left. If you go on and read further in the passage in Yochanan 6, Yeshua goes on to ask the twelve, Are you going to leave me too? And of course, you know, they speak up and they say, where are we going to go? You're the one who has the words of life. Now before this incident, before this multi-day process that occurred with the feeding and then him saying, what he did about his flesh and his blood and the people leaving and, all, and so on and so forth. Before this, Yeshua did miracles to get people to believe in him. He, what he did was he catered to the masses, to the crowds, the multitudes of people. Okay? If you pay attention, after this incident, after this time, he no longer focuses on the multitudes, he begins to focus on his few Talmudim. And he, the miracles that he does after this are only done for those who already believe in him. Okay? So that, that, when you see that, you find out and that solidifies what he was doing. What he was doing was, was proving the people how many of you, when I, am, when I come down on you with the ultimate challenge, hard on you, how many of you are going to stay? And how many, are you le how many of you are leaving? Okay? How many of you are going to believe me, believe in me, and how many of you are going to say, foo with you, I'm going on with my life the way that I was doing before? Abba makes true faith hard to break us out of our egocentricity, out of our self-centeredness. I want to ask you some questions because you need to understand from God's perspective, from the Messiah's perspective, what it's like to deal with us as human beings. Okay? How would you feel, for those of you who are married or have been married, how would you feel if your spouse only married you 
for what you had that they could get. And if once they realized they couldn't get any more out of you, they would leave. And what if the only communication you had with them was because they wanted something? And yet, that was what this big crowd of people were doing to Yeshua. And that, unfortunately, is what too many people in what's called the body today are doing in their relationship with God. They are going to milk God for everything that they can get out of Him. But if it ever comes to a point where they can't get something out of Him, then they're going to go away because they're not meeting his need, their need, He is not meeting their needs anymore. Okay? They're not getting what they want. And here's, here's the truth of the matter. We deserve nothing. Okay? He owes us nothing. By all rights, we are obligated to serve Him for eternity without ever receiving anything in return. That's the truth of the matter. But I wonder how many of us would serve Him, willingly serve Him, under those conditions. If we knew, if we knew that in serving Him, He would not give us anything in return, would we choose to serve Him? I don't think very many people would. If we, Hebrews, Chapter 6. Verses 9 through 12. Hebrews, Evrim, nine, uh, 6, 9 through 12. Now even though we speak this way, dear friends, we are confident that you have the better things that come from being delivered. For God is not so unfair as to forget your work and the love you showed for Him in your past service to His people and in your present service too. However, we want each one of you to keep showing the same diligence right up to the end when your hope will be realized so that you will not become sluggish but will be imitators of those who by their trust and patience are receiving what has been promised. I want to call your attention to the part of the phrase there at the end which says who by their trust and patience are receiving what has been promised. True faith cannot be separated from patience. Flip over to Romans chapter 4. We're going to read... Uh, from 17b, verse 17b through verse 21. It says, Avraham is our father in God's sight because he trusted God as the one who gives life to the dead and calls non-existent things into existence. For he was past hope. Yet in hope he trusted that he would indeed become a father to many nations. And in keeping with what he had been told, so many will your seed be. His trust did not waver when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered that Sarah's womb 
was dead too. He did not, by lack of trust, decide against God's promises. On the contrary, by trust, he was given power as he gave glory to God. For he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he could also accomplish. You remember in past recent messages we talked about Avraham. It was either messages or, or it might have been commentary on the, during the Torah service. But we, I pointed out the fact that when God gave Avraham the promise of having seed, he was 75 years old. And that promise wasn't accomplished until he was 100. Avraham waited patiently in trust in God's promises for 25 years before he saw the realization. Okay? Time and the lack of fulfillment of the words of God are the test of true faith. I'm going to say that again. Time and the lack of fulfillment of the words of God are the test of true faith. True faith still believes even if we die before the fulfillment. That's what it tells us in Hebrews chapter 11. Lists a whole string of people and said they died without being able to see the fulfillment of the promises that God had given. Yeshua likened faith to a small seed, but the seed is not the fruit. He said faith is like a mustard seed. Okay? But that little tiny seed is not the fruit. The fruit comes later. After the seed is planted and cultivated and watered and fertilized and time goes by and the plant has time to grow and mature, then finally the fruit comes. In this culture, we want everything now. And if God doesn't give it right away, we either walk away or we try to fulfill the promise ourselves. And I have been guilty of that myself. Both in the past. And Avraham was not without fault, nor was Sarah. Because after some time had passed, somewhere in the course of that 25 years of waiting, Avraham got antsy. And he began asking God, when are you going to do this, God? All I have right now is the servant, and God says, no, not going to be the servant. Okay, God, what do I do about this then? And I'm sure he discussed his impatience with his wife. Probably on more than one occasion. And Sarah finally said, look, take the matter into your own hands. Here, here's my servant. Go lay with her and have offspring. And after Ishmael came, God said, No, not Ishmael. Last passage to look at Galatians chapter 4. Verses 28 through 31. 
you, brothers, like Yitzchak, are children referred to in a promise of God. But just as then the one born according to limited human capability persecuted the one born through the Spirit's supernatural power, so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Tanakh say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for by no means will the son of the slave woman inherit along with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are children not of the slave woman, but of the free woman. I want to make spiritual application. Again, along the lines of the, the seeds that come from the two trees. Yishmael was of the seed of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yitzchak was of the seed of the tree of life. And according to the scripture, those two are at all times at enmity with one another. This is why we see that Yishmael early on in the life of Yitzchak is found tormenting Yitzchak. And the scripture tells us that that which comes from the flesh or comes from the seed of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will never ever yield fruit of life. It will always yield the fruit of death. Because a tree has to bear after its kind. And so spiritually, if, if we allow Yishmael and Yitzchak to live in the same house, they will war against one another. This is what the scripture refers to when it says that a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. In Greek, the terminology, I've preached this before, the terminology that's used there where it says a double-minded person, it actually, the Greek means two souls warring against one another. Okay? And a person who allows the two souls, the two seeds to war against one another inside of them. The scripture says they will be unstable in all of their ways. You must be single-minded. You're either single-minded along the lines of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or you're single-minded along the lines of the fruit of the tree of life. I want to read three paragraphs from this book, three short paragraphs. The effect of Avraham's lack of patience has been a devastating historical reality. Just as there has been enmity between the Arabs, which are Ishmael's descendants, and the Jews, Isaac's descendants, since that time, there will always be enmity between that which is born of the flesh and the true seed of God. By the time Yitzchak was weaned, Ishmael was already mocking him. We find this in Genesis 21.9. Finally, Avraham drove Yishmael out of his house and disallowed his inheritance. A tree can only bear fruit after its own kind. That which is sown in the flesh must be reaped regardless. Now here's, this is a key statement. That which is sown in the flesh must be reaped regardless of who we are in the Messiah. Just like in this physical realm, if you commit a crime, and then you come to the Lord after you've committed the crime, you may be forgiven by God, but you are going to bear the consequences in this earth. You are going to pay a fine, you're going to spend time in jail, because you have to bear the consequences of the action. Okay? It's the same way in the spirit. 
That which is sown in the flesh must be reaped regardless of who we are in the Messiah. If we revert to the devices of the seed of Cain, even in an attempt to bring about the purposes of God, it will ultimately cause us much trouble. Abraham was chosen by God to bring about his purposes. The promise he had received from God was true. The consequences of Abraham's self-seeking methods are still wreaking international havoc in the world today. Ishmael's brought forth by believing ministries have been no less devastating to the body of the Messiah. There is continual conflict between that which is born of the flesh and that which is born of the Spirit. Because Ishmael was Avraham's son, the Lord blessed him and made him a great nation, even though he knew that he was going to cause trouble for the promised seed. The Lord often blesses our spiritual Ishmaels as well, causing them to prosper. He will use them as much as he can, and they may bless many people. But when Isaac appears, that which is born of the flesh must be driven out. Flesh cannot be an heir with that which is born of the Spirit. True faith. Why is true faith hard? It's because God intentionally makes it hard to test, to see how we're going to respond to Him. All right, let's pray. <sighs> Abba, this is probably, this is the one message that is the hardest for the people in this United States of America to hear. Because we are so affluent, we are so comfortable, we have the things that we need. And so when we come face to face with any kind of lack, any kind of hardship, we whine and complain and we ask to be removed from the situation. And when we're not removed, we point a blaming finger at you and we say, why haven't you? Why haven't you healed me? Why haven't you given me the money? Why haven't you given me a new house or a new car or whatever the case may be? <sighs> Father, give deep spiritual and heart revelation to your people that they will understand and know without any doubt that it will be burned into them so that it is at the forefront of their minds at all times that you Lord God owe us nothing we owe you everything that no matter what comes our way no matter what the circumstances are in our life you still deserve to be worshipped and served But more than that, to understand that whatever you bring into our life, if we really truly believe your character and we trust your character, then we know, Father, that whatever you bring into our life is not to harm us or destroy us. It may be difficult, it may be hard, it may be unpleasant, but it is meant to cause us to grow. And we are to boast in our troubles. And we are to count it all joy when we fall into various trials and tribulations. This 
goes against our nature. But Father, we know that there is a different nature that resides in us by the giving of the life of Yeshua and the power of the resurrection of Yeshua by the Ruach HaKodesh. We have the Ruach living inside of us, which gives us the ability to do supernatural things. We are not bound by the natural. We have gone through Yam Suf and the waters have closed down. We are cut off from the old kingdom of darkness and now we are new people in the kingdom of light. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that in you we have the ability to boast in our troubles and to continue to follow you, to understand there is no other place to go. You have the words of life. We bless your name. We bless your name. In all circumstances, we bless your name. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevaret Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav alecha v'yikunecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.